first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut an MO onto this tooth number 55, or otherwise known as a tooth A. So I'm in with a 556 Fisher Burr. I'm going to go in from the occlusal first, and then I'm going to go down and drop down into my box. Okay, I see a little bit of air onto that mirror. Okay, and then I can see all of the decay. And I'm going to go down and, and make a, a nice flat box, make sure that I've got all of our decay out. So this is going to be a composite. So any little spot that's left decalcification is going to be a problem for this kid. So we want it to be as clean as possible. And now I'm into a big round burr. That might be a little too big, actually. We're not too bad there. Get the rest of that softness out. So with a composite, composites always leak. So we don't want to leave anything behind, any infected dentin behind. It's not like a crown where we're covering it full coverage and we've got that, that good seal. Composites, although they start off sealed really nicely, they tend to shrink or break down. Kids brooks, so we've got issues. I'm just gonna grab my Explorer and feel how we are there. Not too bad. Okay, so this tooth here, tooth number B, I'm gonna do a crown on. I'm not gonna cut that right now because I don't want it to bleed. So I'm gonna put in my composite right now. So the thing we're gonna do, just clean off a little bit of the plaque that they brought with them today. Um, so now we're gonna get our matrices in with our ring. That's how I like it. In. And now, I wanna be sure that I'm gonna be able to get my ring on. So I have to make sure that my little band is tight against the tooth. Otherwise my ring is gonna be a problem. And our trickiest part about this is staying away from the clamp, okay? And seeing where I'm going all at the same time. Bam. <coughs> and there we go. Good, good, and good. Okay, we got our band on, got our ring on, and now we're gonna etch bond. So this Tokuyama product also comes with a blocker if we need to block out any stain. Not super relevant when we're seeing our pediatric patients, but for, our, um, for your adult patients, it might be a little bit more relevant. And we're just shaping it. Remember, it's composite, so we're shaping it, not uh, not packing it down like amalgam was back in the day. For those of us that used to use it, or some of us that still do. Okay, and get our little margin going. Yeah, I want most of my cutting or most of my shaping done here so I don't have to cut it afterwards. Go ahead. <coughs> and then after the cure, I'm going to do uh, another layer, layer of flowable on top. So it's kind of like a sandwiched in between two really thin layers of flowable composite. So flowable as the cap layer yep. is what's your advantage? So I'm using it kind of like a sealant, and um, it's going to fill in any of the any of the cracks or micro fissures. It's just going to give this uh, restoration just a little bit more longevity. So if you notice the the shade of that Omnichroma is blended in completely because it takes on the shade of the tooth around it. And so if you don't want to stock a million shades, it's it's a good thing, and for pedo, you know, shade is not super critical. We just need it to blend. Okay, and um, I'm not sure if I said it out loud. It was in my head, but you know, the the matrix band, the the advantage of the matrix band here is for that, not for the contact so much, because I'm about to put a crown onto that second molar. Uh, but it's more for the gingival margin, so that I've got a nice tight gingival margin and no leakage. Because when we have uh, failure of these restorations, that gingival margin is a common place for us to get failure. 
We'll take our little matrix band off. And now I'm gonna take out my wedge and we're gonna peel the matrix band off. And we've got a non-stick matrix band. But see how tight that was to the gingival margin. And then as far as polishing goes, I just really want to get that marginal ridge polished. I don't really want to touch the area where I pl place the flowable for, for the sealant placement. So I'm going back to my big round burr and I'm just going to get any, any flash off of that area there. And then I take a flat instrument and I'm going to take any flash of the material off of, uh, off of that mesial and distal area. So a little bit etch on there there and there. And that's basically all there is to it. So now that MO is, is pretty much done. I'm going to go in. I've got a distal to do on the um, cuspid here. So I'm going to take the occlusal off of my first molar and because I'm prepping this for a crown and I want to I want to be able to visualize that distal directly but I don't want to cause a lot of bleeding. I'm going on my occlusal. Okay, so just our our prep, and then a bit of a bevel on the palatal and the lingual. And like I said, I want to be able to visualize that distal. So I'm taking that crown down anyway. So I'm cutting down into the into the molar, so I can see that. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but there's a, a distal lesion here and if I can do that I can be super conservative and not have to cut in from the lingual or cut in from the palatal. So I'm going to use that little wedge again. And I think I might have sent flying. There we are. And I always think of these little wedges as uh, feathers. Like, a, like they've got feathers on them. They don't back out. And so I've just got that in there because I don't want any, any bleeding happening there. And we look like we're pretty good. So we're going to just dry that distal and then I'm going to etch, etch bond and sort of probably this one's small enough that I'm just going to put some flowable in there. I'm going to etch that and then we'll have a, you know, smaller we, we can have our restoration, the better success that we're going to have. If we get too big, then we have all kinds of problems like shrinkage and risk of higher risk of failure okay so again with our bond yep. i'm going to cure that and then we're going to put some flowable into the area okay and again this is our escalate flowable and if we're good enough and accurate enough I can get right to the base there and just sort of backfill good and then I'm just gonna take a flat instrument and sort of make sure that it's all in there I'm not worried about bonding to this um, 54 or tooth B because I'm gonna slice it down for my crown anyway and at the same time, I'm going to contour anything else that needs to be contoured on that tooth A. We'll take out our nice wedge. I've got my occlusal done already, and now I've got to do my mesial and distal slice for my tooth B. So this is for our crown. This is going to be a, a stainless steel crown. I'm going to make sure I don't dis ditch the uh, distal of my cuspid. And that tooth is not looking super lovely. It's looking kind of dark. I'm hoping it's not necrotic on us, but we'll find out. A little bit of his uh, last night's supper stuck in there. So that's our basic crown prep, and now we have to get the decay out from here. So I'm going to go in starting on our distal and clean it up that way. So it looks like it's totally going to be into the pulp of the tooth. I'm already into the occlusal. So I'm taking the coronal portion out of that tooth. And we have some vitality, so that's good. As long as it's not hyperemic, we'll be even better. I'm going to take my big round burr again. 
This is a number eight slow speed burr and taking the coronal portion out. And this is just a, gonna be an old fashioned form of Cresol pulpotomy. So we're gonna, first thing I'm gonna do is put a little bit of pressure on here with some gauze. And that pressure is gonna stop some of the hemorrhage. So this is just a little sterile gauze. So we're in the operating room today. So that's what we've got. That's what I'm using. I'm just gonna hold that in place. And now we've got some um, form of Cresol that's gonna go into that area. So these are some form of Cresol soaked cotton pellets. I'm gonna put it in and I'm gonna leave that in while I try my crown size on. Okay, I flip my water off. I just wanna contour it a little bit better. I don't like that, the way it's looking. So it's a little bit of enamoplasty because nothing if not a little bit neurotic here. And now we'll get our crown sizes going. So we've got our Formacresol pellet in. In the meantime, I've been fitting the crown to choose the right size. And then we're going to uh, squeeze it mesiodistally and um, also crimp it down to make it fit. So we just slide it on, nice snap. I'm gonna pop it off. So now I'm gonna take the Formacresol out of the chamber and I'm gonna put in um, some IRM. And it's a nice hemostasis achieved there. And let me get our IRM in and we're ready for some glue for the crown. Use a glass ionomer cement so we're not worried about any kind of hemorrhage that you're seeing. Not a big deal. Give it a little rinse. And uh, crown down. You should see a lot of cement coming out. Then we're going to give it a rinse again. And just in case that crown lifts, I'm going to keep my cotton pliers on there. Okay, and I'll take a piece of floss. And we'll clean up the cement on the inner proximals. Give it a little rub. There, keep your finger on that crown when you're flossing through so it doesn't pop up on you. Okay, and we are fairly good to go. 